Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I welcome the opportunity to present my research. So today I'm going to talk about a number of ion neutral reactions that I studied while at UNLV and that took place at under one electron volt energies. And this is a part of the energy uh, spectrum that's not studied a whole lot for a number of reasons. Uh, that m have mostly technical limitations, but um, so what did I study? Um, I studied what we call deuterium abstraction in water ions. So by abstraction I mean you tag on an extra deuterium onto your ion and this reaction is essentially a, an abstraction, deuterium abstraction reaction in water. Deuterium substitution in monodurated hydronium, this ion here is called monodurated hydronium and by substitution of course that's exactly what the word says you replace one of the hydrogens with one of the deuterium. So you go from H2DO plus to HD2O plus. Uh, I also studied charge transfer reactions of alpha particles or helium doubly charged ions, essentially completely stripped helium atoms, with a number of neutrals, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, hydrogen deuterium, and methane, uh, and a bunch of nobles, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. And of course, when this is the neutral right there, and this is your alpha particle, when the alpha particle grabs one of the electrons of the neutral, we have what we call the single charge transfer. When it grabs both of the electrons and becomes neutral itself, we have what we call the double charge transfer. When that X happens to be another helium neutral atom, then we have the resonant charge transfer, and they essentially swap charge. So why did I do that? Well, I had nothing better to do, but also, um, uh, as it happens, the uh, deuterium abstraction and substitution uh, reactions may help explain why Mars, for example, has a higher uh, heavy to lower water to light water ratio concentration. Um, re as recently as a few weeks ago, I think the opportunity measured it to be about five times higher than on Earth. So Mars, as we know, doesn't have as much of a magnetic uh, field as Earth does, so he's not as protected from uh, ionizing radiation. So ionization in Mars happens a lot more easier than it does on Earth, so it's more likely to have those uh, reactions between ions and neutrals. So this could be one of the channels that may help explain the higher content of heavy water to regular light water. The alpha particles are the ash of nuclear fusion. What do I mean by ash? Well, um, we have a tritium nucleus and a deuterium nucleus, and we get an alpha particle or a helium nucleus plus a neutron plus, so I think 17 MeV, scale or take, I'm not sure about that number. So the ash is this guy right here, and of course this is nuclear physics, not atomic physics, but it's implied that this is a nucleus, so this is in fact doubly charged helium. It, it, is, it is an alpha particle. So this, this guy exists in nuclear fusion reactions, so if you were to study its charge transfer reactions with all those neutrals I mentioned, and that can be found in nuclear reactors, in nuclear fusion reactors, you might be able to obtain a value for that charge transfer reaction, how fast it goes. Now charge transfer reactions usually cool the plasma. Cooling the plasma means failure of fusion. So this is an energy that hasn't been studied thus far. And it is important to obtain how fast that reaction happens. So you, when you model your fusion uh, reaction, take into account losses from cooling of that alpha particle, which is the ash mm -hmm. the reaction. Um, and of course those alpha particles are the product of a naturally occurring fusion. Our sun, that's what happens with our sun. We have the hydrogen being fused into alpha particles. So knowing what those, how those alpha particles uh, react with hydrogen, which is one of the most abundant um, elements in our universe, as well as a number of the other neutrals that can be found in our atmosphere or other atmospheres is important when you're trying to model the atmospheres or other uh, astrophysical phenomena. So in short, that's why we did this. So how we did this? Uh, this is what my apparatus looks like. We have a cathode where the uh, ions are being created by the electrons being ejected from it. 
the cathode is essentially a hot filament that uh, produces electrons. And in order to control how those electrons are being released, we have the cathode at a positive bias or we apply a positive potential at all times, except when we want to create ions and we apply a negative potential. The electrons are being ejected from the cathode and they impact on neutrals that are found in my chamber, remove that electron and turn the neutrals into ions. So that's how we produce the ions. Now there, in, we select the ions, and I'll get into selection on my next slide, by applying the appropriate RF potential on the trap shown here. It has a DC offset as well. So it has an amplitude, a frequency, and a DC offset. And typically when, I, when we talk about RF, we mean a few hundred kilohertz to about a megahertz. Peak-to-peak um, -peak value for the amplitude, uh, around 1,000 volts. So we store the ions in there. We allow it to interact, then we throw it, we kick it out, we turn off the trapping potential and we apply a positive potential on the left and a negative on the right. We eject it into the time of flight drift tube where they're being mass analyzed. So essentially, depending on the ion's mass to charge ratio, it will have a different time of flight. So we'll see a spectrum corresponding to hydrogen arriving at x microseconds, deuterium at x plus y microseconds, nitrogen ion at different number of microseconds, and they impinge on, they, they hit this microchannel plate as we call it, and they produce an electrical signal. The microchannel plate, essentially, you have an ion hitting it, and then you get millions of electrons out, out of us, and uh, it works like a night vision sensors. That's how they work, although instead of ions, they have photons, so it amplifies what you have. So we repeat the process, we store the ion, allow it to react with the neutral longer time, do it again, longer still, do it again, longer still, and you get the pattern of the decay. And from that decay, you can essentially get the uh, rate coefficient. And this essentially is a timing electronic, not of importance to explain how this actually works. I mean, I, I explained a little bit, but this is more detail how the electronics work. Okay, um, so let's see how it looks like in real life. Not as pretty. Here it is. So this is my vacuum chamber. Now, in order to measure just charge transfer of the ions and neutrals I care about, I must ensure I have nothing else in there. So this must all take place in what we call an ultra-high vacuum chamber. An ultra, our our ultra-high vacuum chamber is at the ultra-high vacuum conditions, which is approximately 10 to the minus 11 torr in our case, so one atmosphere is about 760 torr, so this is quite low, as you can tell. And we maintain that pressure by using a turbomolecular pump and a roughing rotary vane pump. Uh, here's the trap assembly right here, and it goes into that flange in there. The cathode is right underneath it. The time of flight drift tube is right there. And so the ions are being ejected out of the trap and essentially, oh here it is, enter the time of flight drift tube. So they gain a potential energy that's given by their charge times the potential, right? We know that from our ba main physics. Now they enter the drift tube, which is essentially a Faraday cage, so they don't see the uh, potential anymore. And that is being converted to a uh, kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy can be also written, the velocity can also be rewritten as the length of the drift tube divided by the time of flight squared. So if you were to solve for the time of flight is given by divided by so you can see from there that the time of flight of an ion depends entirely on its mass to charge ratio. Uh, the potential is the same, and hopefully the drift tube doesn't expand, so, so we're good. Um, so the only thing that determines the arrival time or the time of flight, which is the identifying element of the ion, is its mass to charge ratio. Now that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. That means you cannot tell singly charged molecular hydrogen, which is 2 to 1 mass to charge ratio, from doubly charged helium-4, which is 4 divided by 2, also 2, so we cannot distinguish those two, and that can be a problem. And I had to use a number of um, tricks to resolve that issue. I wanted to make sure I only had one species of ions of, of mass-to-charge ratio to not 
three or four species. So we also have a number of uh, re gas reservoirs that release the neutral gas to be ionized or reacting with the ion. There's a number of, uh, you can't really see them here, a number of uh, ultra-high pure cylinders, uh, cylinders of ultra-high pure gases that we use. There's also a quadruple mass spectrometer that um, analyzes the gases in terms of content to make sure the gases are in fact very pure because we don't want to have anything else react with our ions. And you can see some of the timing electronic boxes here. There's a whole rack to the left and to the right that's not shown. And the MCP detector right there. So I'm going to talk about how we select the ions we want and we eliminate the ones we don't. As I mentioned in my introduction, we have this potential being applied to the trap. It has an amplitude, a frequency, and a DC offset. So if we were to plot the AZ and QZ, which are solutions to the mass theory equations, and I'm not going to get into that because that's beyond the scope of my talk. So we have plotting of AZ against QZ. We have what we call the stability diagram. So ions that have AZ and QZ coordinates that are a factor of their charge, their mass, the DC offset, the frequency, and these are the uh, traps, physical uh, dimensions, the radius and the length. I ions that have an AZ and QZ that falls inside the stability diagram will remain inside the trap and will essentially perform a simple harmonic motion in 3D. Ions that are outside the stable region label unstable, we will escape the trap and we won't have to worry about them. So the way we select them is by applying the appropriate V0, omega, and user, essentially the appropriate amplitude, frequency, and DC offset. So in here, what I have here in this example, I applied three different DC offsets. In the, in the position one, as I label it, the um, upside, uh, the erect triangles, I eliminate ions with mass to charge 16 and lower, such as methane, which is CH4 singly charged, CH4 plus. So I eliminate those guys because I don't want them for my water reaction, and I'll explain that later on. And in position two, I eliminate um, ions with mass to charge ratio of 26 and higher, such as hydrocarbons, uh, singly charged carbon monoxide, etc. And finally, in position three, after I eliminate all the ions I don't want, I return and I have an ideal, ideal position for my water to study. So I apply three different DC offsets to kill the ones I don't want and keep the ones I do. So let's uh, take a look and see what happens. So here's my time of flight spectrum. This is actual data. Master charge 18 is shown right there. This is my water. And remember, water is H2O plus. And master charge 20 is also shown. So we have water ion with deuterium becoming monodeuterated hydronium plus a bunch of products and energy. So I have 18 going to 20. And you can see as I pour more deuterium, the 18 gets smaller and the 20 gets bigger and bigger as time goes by. So I start from 0.165 seconds all the way to 3. 18 almost disappears and 20 gets bigger and then 20 also becomes 21. 21 becomes 22. So all of my water, which is right there, became 20, 21, and 22, became deuterated some form of um, deuterated hydronium. And as I explained before, the ion is identified by its time of flight. So uh, heavier mass to charge means longer time of flight. Excuse me, what was the Y value there? The Y value? Um, well, I mean, it's just uh, um, intensity, I suppose. So it's usually volts, but in this case, I have a whole bunch of them stacked. So we have an MCP. This is actually volts and the X value seconds, microseconds. Okay, well, what's the progression? Yes, so black is 0.165 seconds. Oh, oh, oh okay. And, and purple is three seconds. So it's, okay. yeah, it's a little inverted from what you would expect, but yeah. Okay. So you go from up to down instead of, yeah. Yeah. So I, I took another look at it and saw what that looked like. So we start from 18 water becoming deuterium. Uh, 20, becoming doubly deuterated, sorry, monodeuterated hydronium, becoming doubly deuterated hydronium to fully deuterated hydronium. So
So these are the steps, and this is what they call in uh, nuclear physics cascading decay. It's been studied there. So if I were to look at those reactions, so my mass to charge 20 grows by the decay rate of water and decays by the substitution rate of monitor hydronium. So this is the differential equation that would describe the change in population of 20, this guy. So solving that differential equation and taking the initial conditions into account, this is the equation that describes the population of 20. Uh, it's the population of singly charged uh, water at time t equals zero multiplied by these parameters. So if I were to monitor this guy here and fit its population time evolution, I would get those R1 and R2, which are the abstraction and substitution decay rates respectively. So I can get two different values just by monitoring this population. So I went ahead and I did a simulation. I plotted them to see what they look like. And this is the graph I'm plotting. This is not actual data. This is just modeling. So in black, it's 1,000 to 1 for R2 to R1, the substitution to abstraction. In red is 100 to 1. And in blue, 10 to 1. And green, 2 to 1. So this is what it should look like if I were to fit it, and if, it, if this equation described it. So there were uh, some issues I had to overcome before I proceeded with my measurement. For example, the substitution went really, really slow. So you wanted to make sure that whatever is causing the reduction in my uh, H2DO plus population was just substitution and nothing else. Because if I was measuring substitution in something else, I cannot present it as substitution alone. So there were the uh, what we call elastic collision losses. So we had to take care of those. Um, substitution is very slow. So what I did, I used uh, an ion of similar mass to charge ratio, 19, and I let it sit there, and it did not react with anything else. So I let it sit there and see how fast it leaked out of the uh, out of the trap. Now we also, so I used hydronium, regular hydronium, HO plus, and because it does not react with hydrogen, I increased my hydrogen pressure as high as the deuterium would have been and saw how fast it leaked. And as it turned out, that was okay. The loss rate from collisions is sufficiently slow, uh, slow four, inverse, uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 3 inverse seconds at the highest pressure of what deuterium would have been. So that resolved that issue. Another issue, because of the proximity of the different ions I was studying, so I was only going from 18 to 20 to 21, etc. I want to make sure I had the appropriate resolution because I did not want my peaks to overlap. So to do that, I use collisional cooling. So when you have something lighter hitting something heavier, it usually cools it. So I used uh, helium to cool them collisionally because helium is a nice uh, noble gas that does not react. So I had an extra uh, um, valve open that allowed helium in there and cooled my, my peaks and made them even sharper. That also helped with the loss rates. It brought down the loss rate. So I improved resolution and I made it less likely for the ion to escape the trap because it was now cooler and less likely to get out of the trap through elastic collision. And next up. Um, okay, I wanted to eliminate all those other ions that produce the deuterated species were similar to 20. Remember, uh, as I explained on the board, the only thing that determines the time of flight is the mass to charge ratio. So for example, if I have a fully deuterated methane, and methane ion is this guy, let's say after a number of reactions it becomes this. Well, as it turned out, it has four deuterium, four deuteria, I should say, times 2, 8, and the carbon is 12, so this is also 20. So I did not want to have any methane in there because it is a good possibility. It might essentially become another 20, and I do not want it to be in the same group as my H2DO+, which was also master charge 20. So I wanted to eliminate those guys. Argon double plus. That's also another issue, yeah. I mean, we don't have that much in our chamber, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, you don't want anything that's close to 20 because that messes up your peak. You only want to have H2DO plus and nothing else, right? Because you're measuring, you don't measure anything, basically. Another issue um, was to make sure that the stored ion, um, water ions were at their ground state. So I did not want to have a mixture of excited water ions and ground state ions or just excited uh, water ions. I mean, I couldn't tell either way. So I studied... I found different papers that actually measured that, and they found that the longest lived metastable electronic state of uh, w water was 10 microseconds, and the longest vibronic was the first bending. And essentially, the water uh, molecule, it's H2O plus, so it's just my body is oxygen and my fist is hydrogen. So it can do three types of motions. This is the bending motion. This is the uh, symmetric stretching motion, and this is the anti-symmetric stretching motion. So the bending motion is the one that was the longest lived uh, vibrationally. So because my measurements take place at 140 milliseconds or longer, this ensured that uh, I was at least safe from the um, electronic. So they, they had plenty of time to, do, to go down to their ground state. So that ensured that I had all my water ions at ground state, not a mixture of excited and ground states. And, yeah, this is, a, this is the sources where I got this information about the uh, values of the lifetimes. <clears throat> okay. And here's a demonstration of how that uh, triple, triple value DC offset works. On top, we have single DC offset. This is what the spectrum looks like, and I identify them at different mass to charge ratios. This, uh, 12 is probably carbon, uh, 18 is my water, and then I have a bunch of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide to the right. So after I apply that triple value DC offset to shift my ions in the stability diagram, this is what I have left. I have eliminated all the unwanted guys, and I'm left with just the stuff I want. And finally, I apply some deuterium, and I can study my reaction. I mean, uh, there's some 17 and 16, but not enough to cause any problems uh, over there. So this is how this works. So the triple DC offset eliminated the stuff I don't want and let me keep the stuff I want it. And here's some actual experimental data. As you can see, my model looks closer to maybe 100 to 1, somewhere between 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1 for one rate with respect to the other. So I obtained those different decay rates and I plotted them against their corresponding number densities of deuterium. The slope would give me the abstraction rate coefficient and the substitution rate coefficient. So in this case, I have R2, R, R1. The slope gives me the abstraction rate coefficient. In this case, I have R2. The slope gives me the substitution rate coefficient. Um, as you can see, this is really tiny, big error bars, and um, as it turned out, really, really slow. The abstraction rate is reasonably fit, so we have to take a closer look to the substitution rate and see what that does. So, um, so the abstraction rate coefficient, as I measured it, was comparable to the abstraction rate coefficient of water with regular hydrogen. So what I measured was 5.8 10 to the minus 10 for abstraction with deuterium, and I think the abstraction with hydrogen is about 6-ish, if I don't, low 6. So this is comparable to that. The substitution rate coefficient was one of the slowest ever measured by my group, and very susceptible to contamination, because the slower it is, the more likely it is to be contaminated, and uh, leaks caused by other reasons. So I took another look at my data and I saw that uh, annoying peak 19. So again, top is shortest, bottom is longest. So it's backwards. So that peak 19 persists. So first it goes away by the 0.84 seconds almost gone, but then it reappears and grows bigger. So what's that 19? Where is it coming from, and is it affecting my peak 20? I had to look into that. Um, so after some, uh, uh, so after some, some search, I determined that the peak 19 had to be regular hydronium, not uh, monodurated water, because they both have the same 
massive charge ratio, but this guy disappears right away, it doesn't stick around. This guy abstracts right away with deuterium. This guy st sticks around. So where could that monodurohydronium have come from? As it turned out, <coughs> it could have come from reactions with neutral water. It's a pretty fast rate, and even though I don't have that high concentration of water, high number of density of water in my chamber, because my um, <coughs> substitution rate is so slow, just a little bit of water could do that damage and produce that 19. So I did some scans, I tried to look for the source of neutral water, and I did some scans on my gases, deuterium and hydrogen. And I used my quadruple mass spectrometer. As it turned out though, the quadruple mass spectrometer is not the best way to go when you're looking for water in deuterium and hydrogen gases, because if you use an ionizing technique to look for water, you're actually producing water, so it's, it's useless. You have to use a non-ionizing technique. So what we did is we outsourced that, and we had what we call a gas chromatography test done on it. And they reported that our gases were good. We got some fancy expensive deuterium gas that had 3.3 parts per million of water. We repeated the measurement. And 19 was still there. <coughs> it would not go away. So I had to look for other sources of water that caused the production of that 19, H3O+. Um, so as it turned out, the barium oxide cathode because of its proximity to the trap, it could continually degas and give me water and hydrogen. Um, and here it is. Here's an actual picture. Here's the cylindrical trap right there. And here's the cathode glowing red. So it's really close to the trap. So even though it might be degassing very little water, because the substitution, the treatment substitution rate is so slow, it could affect my measurements. So at this point, there was nothing I could do about the cathode, I suppose. And we had to scrap the substitution measurement. That was an upper limit for it. And the abstraction rate was pretty fast, so we didn't have to worry about this. But the substitution, deuterium substitution in, in monodurate hydronium would have to be scrapped. That what we observed was probably an upper limit. So moving on to my um, double charge helium. So why do we choose double charge helium-3 and not double charge helium-4. As it turned out, as I explained, the time of flight is dependent on the mass to charge ratio. So if I use doubly charge helium-4, it would have the same time of flight as singly charged molecular hydrogen. So if I was looking at what I thought was peak two, I would get a, mix a mixture of both. I've already tried that, and I got some uh, discouraging results, and that'll be my next slide, actually. Um, helium-3 is nice. You got a mass of charge 1.5, which we did not have in our spectrum. So I like that. Uh, it's very hard to obtain. You need special permission. You need to know somebody who knows somebody. It's really big right now for, I think, neutron detectors. It has the biggest cross-section. So it actually went up in price. It used to be $150 per liter. Now it's $3,000 per liter and, and, and rising. So I think it's a few million dollars per gram, if you want to do it per gram. Uh, well, I think the source is tritium from nuclear reactors decaying to something like that. So, yeah. So, everybody wants it. The people that built the detectors for neutron want it. And, uh, so, we, we, luckily, we knew someone who had some helium-3. Uh, he hasn't asked for any, any money back yet, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I thank him in my paper. I think that's good enough. What else does he <laughs> What else does he want? Okay. Um, when you get your Nobel Prize. Yeah. No, I, I, that's, that's why I got this job. I had to pay him off. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so because it's so expensive, it, it, has, uh, it comes in small quantities. I think we got five liters worth of that stuff. And because it comes in small quantities, there's little room for error. So you cannot repeat your measurement. You, you can do it a few times, but you can't do it forever. You're going to run out or you're going to have so little left in the cylinder, it's going to be contaminated. And because there's no room for error, it's also so little of it, it's more susceptible to contamination. So here's what I thought was uh, doubly charged helium-4. And here's what I obtained uh, experimentally when I used doubly charged helium-4. And here's what happens from other sources when you have hydrogen. So you can see my measurement is actually nitrogen is almost right on. And they're within each other's... Uh, error, more or less. So what I thought my master charge 2 was doubly charged helium was in fact singly, was a mixture of singly charged hydrogen 
and double charge helium. So I could not use helium-4, which is cheaper and easier to get. So we had to use helium-3. And here's what happens when I'm doing resonant charge transfer of helium with similar isotopes, same isotopes. So here, this is what we call the resonant charge transfer, that essentially swap charges. This guy grabs his, his two electrons and he becomes an alpha particle. Downstairs is the single charge transfer. So they just grab one electron off them and they both become singly charged. Now, when you use two different isotopes, so when you use a single isotope, if I were to observe it in my spectrum, I would not be able to measure the double charge transfer, resonant charge transfer, because for every doubly charged helium I destroy on the left, I produce on the right. So if I were to look at it on my spectrum, I would see no difference. The only thing that would affect the population of double charged helium would be the single charge transfer. Essentially, the resonant charge transfer does nothing to it. On the other hand, and this is the beauty of, of, of this experiment, when you use two different isotopes, so you have doubly charged helium-3, one and a half, resonant charge transfer with helium-4, so one and a half becomes two. So if you're observing that mass one and a half and you see it being decreased not only by the single charge transfer, but also from the resonant charge transfer, because you're replacing one and a half with two. So when you use two different isotopes, that works out great. So how do we do that resonant charge transfer measurement? Well, first we used two different isotopes. Um, so we had double charge helium-3 reacting with neutral helium-4. So what we got, the rate coefficient we observed was single charge transfer, double charge transfer, as well as, unfortunately, uh, losses from elastic collisions because the helium-3 is so light it can be pumped out of the trap by elastic collisions without any charge transfer happening. In a second measurement, we used the same isotope, a single isotope, helium-3 in this case. Just helium-3, no helium-4. So we had helium-3 doubly charged reacting with helium-3. So in that case, the only thing you would measure is the single charge transfer and losses from elastic collisions. So you have resonant and single charge transfer and, and losses from collisions, single and loss from collisions. So all you have to do is take the single losses from collisions observed in two and correct one, and that will give you the resonant charge transfer rate coefficient. So we had to do two sets of measurements, basically. And these are the conditions I use to get my one and a half. Um, it's not really important, but I'll just summarize it as eliminating protons and singly charged helium-3 and helium-4, eventually coming to this position, which is a nice stable position for my master charge, one and a half, or doubly charged helium-3. And here it is, nice and clean. Here's my helium-3, two plus, nothing else there. I was able to actually get it to just be one and a half, nothing else. And again, top is shorter uh, times and bottom is longer times. So the longer you let it react with the other helium neutrals, the smaller it gets. So we produce the ions by electron impact ionization. We stored it, then we varied the time we uh, trapped it, ejected it into the time of flight drift tube, and then detected it. We repeated that for a longer time still, and we had to do some normalization because the um, cathode tended to drift. So we had a reference trap time that we divided every single measurement we got to normalize it for the, those drifts. So the intensity is described by the normalized uh, intensity at time t equals zero times the number density of helium-4 times the uh, rate coefficient of resonant, single, and losses multiplied by time. So if I were to graph the intensity against time, I will get a nice, simple exponential decay and that's in fact what I got. These are actual experimental data. So this is helium-3 doubly charged with helium-4. So what causes the decay in the signal is resonant charge transfer, single charge transfer, and a little bit of losses from elastic collisions. And the inset has this guy, because I chopped it off, it goes too long. So the inset has the lower pressure. I, I can't quite read those uh, pressure values. 
Yeah, you want me to give yeah, you a... 3.4 times 10. 10 to the minus 7. Seven. Yeah. Yeah, all the way to... Okay. Yeah. Okay. All the way to 2 times 10 to the minus 6. Yeah. Okay. 4. So, essentially, this is what the decay rate is being described as being... Uh, this is what the decay rate will be, as I explained. So, we went ahead and plotted that decay rate against the number density, the slope would be all this, the resonant charge transfer, the single charge transfer, and the losses from elastic collisions, uh, rate coefficients. And here's the actual decay rate plotted against the number density. And as I explained, that's what the slope will give you, will give you that value. Now remember, my goal was to measure just K20. Don't want the other two. So I had to go ahead and use a single isotope <coughs> and here it is I repeated the process I'm not showing the decay curves now just went straight to the decay rates against number density of helium 3 so the slope here will give me just the single charge transfer and the losses rate coefficient so I can go back to my original measurement my first measurement and correct it for these two that I obtained And as it turned out, that measurement I did with a single isotope indicated that my losses from elastic collisions were the dominant process. It was 100 times on single charge transfer. Still, uh, not as fast as the RCT, the resonant charge transfer uh, rate coefficient. It was quite fast. So this took place at approximately 1200 Kelvin equivalent temperature. And we found it to be 5.9 plus minus 0.610 to the minus 10 cubic centimeters per second. This, in fact, was published in November, and you can still access it. It, it has free access for a full year because the uh, General Physics B editor figured it would uh, have an um, impact in future research, so a full free access for a year. And you can go and find it and get more detail if you like. So also a theoretical treatment in it. Okay, now we go to the alpha particles with the rest of them the um, other neutrals essentially so we have a series of neutrals that we let them react because again I am op I'm, I'm just obtaining my measurement by looking at the doubly charged helium-3 and how fast it decays I cannot use a cool different isotope trick in this case when I have different um, neutrals so the, what I'm measuring is the sum of double charge transfer single charge transfer and losses from elastic collisions. So again, those elastic collisions become even bigger of an issue. Now imagine my xenon, which is 126, is it? Hitting my helium-3. It's, it's very likely it will dislodge it from the trap without, um, without charge transfer. So I have to know how fast is that elastic collision loss rate coefficient. So how did I measure that elastic collision? Uh, rate coefficient. I use singly charged helium-4 and that works great for the noble gases because the, that they don't charge transfer at all. The, the rate coefficient for charge transfer of a noble gas with a singly charged helium-4 is near 10 to the minus 15. So whatever I measure that caused the helium-4 to go down in intensity was caused by elastic collisions and I was able to obtain that elastic collision separately. So I could go back to my original measurement and correct it for elastic collisions, also taking into account the charge, of course. Now, when we, well, here's some actual data. So here's helium-3, 2 plus with neon. And you can see the slope here gives you double charge transfer, single charge transfer rate coefficient, and elastic collision losses rate coefficient. And here's how we obtain the losses from elastic collisions, having helium-4 singly charge reacting with neon, this decay is caused entirely by elastic collisions. So the slope here will give me the elastic collision rate coefficient, which I can go back and correct. There and just, just measure the double and single charge transfer of double charge helium with the novel. Here it is with argon again, same idea. Pretty nice tight fit. Uh, and here it is for taking into account the uh, Elastic collision losses when I have argon react with singly charged helium-4 
this decay is caused almost entirely by elastic collisions. And we also did another, another experiment. We wanted to see what effect would a different location in the stability diagram have. Now, moving the ion in a different location means the ion has a different energy. It's in a different pseudo-potential well, so its energy depends on how deep the well is. So we went ahead and measured using our two heaviest ions, xenon and krypton, and this is what we found for the combined double and single charge transfer. So in the default location, krypton was 4.02, and the new location was 4.17, well within each other's error. So we, even if we raise the temperature by uh, about a couple more thousand degrees, it's still more or less the same within each other's error. Now, the, obtaining the losses, the leaks from elastic collisions for the non-nobles is a different issue because the non-nobles will react readily with helium-4+. plus. So you can't use the same trick. You can't have helium-4 singly charged reacting with nitrogen because they will charge transfer before they uh, do elastic collision losses. So we had to use what we already had. So in the case of nitrogen, we used uh, neon elastic collision loss. And because we had, they have similar masses, and the reduced mass is about, it's approximately the same, the reduced mass of ion neutral, so it's about the same. All you have to do is take the polarizability into account, because the elastic collision cross-section goes as the square root of the polarizability of the neutral. So all you had to do is get the value you got from neon and multiply it by the ratio of the square root of the polarizabilities of nitrogen to neon. That will roughly give you the elastic collision uh, rate co losses, rate coefficients for nitrogen, um, methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen deuterium, etc. And here's all the measurements shown here. This is the resonant charge transfer. Everything else is um, double and single charge transfer. So neon, argon, krypton, xenon, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, deuterium, methane, and nitrogen. So in conclusion, I was able to uh, measure the total charge transfer rate coefficients of double charge helium, essentially the double and single charge transfer, with a number of neutrals, as well as the resonant charge transfer of double charge helium with itself, of course. Uh, energies under 1 EV are about 1,200 to 2,400 Kelvin. So that's uh, an area that hasn't been studied at all, or there's little information about it. And I was also able to obtain the abstraction rate coefficient in water, which is of importance to um, planetary atmospheres, cometary atmospheres, etc. And of course, this is important to fusion. Uh, we were not able to obtain a, a definitive answer on the substitution rate coefficient, so we just set an upper limit and left it at that. Um, so I would like to, at this point, finish my talk and thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Cornelius, for giving me the helium-3 again. And, <laughs> and of course, members of my committee, Dr. Lepp and Dr. Pravica, as well as the uh, Brad Clark, the other graduate student, who helped a lot with the measurements. No, somebody else, but it looks cool though, yeah. Yeah, it looks cool. Well, is he contemplating Japanese? Yeah, I, I've seen people doing it. I haven't. I've oh. always made up excuses. I'm going to get my cell phone wet or whatever. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. One day I will. Okay. Is there any way to transfer your reaction rates into uh, cross sections? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Unfortunately, no. Because it's, it's, it's uh, reversible kind of. Some semi-reversible kind of reaction. You, you, can, you can go from, so you, rate coefficients to cross-sections that you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can't do that because I have, a, have an ensemble. So I have a number of different velocities. So if I were to do it, I will lose a lot of info. So if there are any spikes, I would miss them. So you can go from rate coefficients, sorry, we can go from cross-sections to rate coefficients using the average velocity, but you can't do the opposite. Yeah, I, get, I got that question from a reviewer in, the, in, my, in my article, actually. So yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, that's because uh, people that do this 
charge transfer work usually work with accelerators and right. they've got cross sections. Yeah, the, the, the beauty of using those, I guess, they can use mono energetic beams, right? And we don't have that. But, but just try to get a one EV beam. I mean. <laughs> right. That's why. That's why mine is is unique. Right. Yeah. yeah. Correct. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> Comment, yeah. the stability diagram. Uh -huh. Little history on that. Uh, there was a guy named Norm McLaughlin that wrote the book on Matthew functions oh, because okay. that had been a long standing problem. No one had ever solved it. Right. And he was a prisoner of war in a German prison camp. Wow. And he, and he figured out that whole thing. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, well, it's yeah. your guy named Norm McLaughlin. I'll, I'll look it up later, actually. So yeah. he, might, he, he wrote the book, McLaughlin. You know, right. On Matthew so he was a mathematician then, or? Well, I guess he was. Okay. He was a, a British guy. Yeah. And um, I knew somebody at UConn who had met him, or, or knew him earlier. She was a mathematician. So. Oh. Well, I mean, I, I guess I have him to thank for my measurements, right? <laughs> Yeah. That, that whole thing yeah. about quantum pole spectrometers and so forth right. is, is due to him. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's all. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you. Could you repeat the relevance to astrophysics again? Yeah. So you have alpha particles in uh, cosmic radiation and solar winds. So when, when they enter atmospheres, they will find nitrogen, they will find um, a number of other neutrals, so they will charge transfers. You can use that to model the uh, atmosphere and you can also use it to because the uh, comets comet cometary tails also can find those alpha particles from solar winds and of course the deuterium I was talking about it may help explain why you have higher heavy water to light water content in, on Mars than on Earth and my um, hypothesis was because Mars has no magnetic field or very little then it, it's, um, it's uh, water can be ionized and react with deuterium a lot more than it does on Earth. Can you just, just a general question? Sure. Well, that is, you dissociate helium-3 and helium-4 with chirogenics and they're really vastly quantum well, properties. Yeah, bosons versus fermions. Yeah. 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 Is there do you see anything with that with higher temperatures? No. No, not at my temperature. No. I mean uh, uh, no, I don't I don't I don't think there's a huge difference. There's actually a theoretical treatment in my paper. I, I I didn't write it, but you can read more on it. But I, I think our conclusion was that there's no no effect. Right, you have to use the uh, Cooper pairs, whatever they're called, or something. Yeah. Is that how that works? Yeah. Okay, so. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, wow, you all stayed to the end. Wow, good. <laughs>